Good morning. My name is Sam. I am an alcoholic, and I am also a son of recovery. Let's start out with the serenity prayer. Good and gracious God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. So, I finished reading the A Big Book, and now I'm on to the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. This is the book that uh, we use in Alcoholics Anonymous to more thoroughly go through um, each of these pieces of the program. Uh, I think most people are very familiar with the 12 steps, but I don't, I think most non-AA people are unfamiliar with the 12 traditions um, in general. So I just thought this was then a great book to get back into. Um, as always, I'm going to start with the introduction and the foreword because my dad always told me that those were very important things to read. So the introduction. Alcoholics Anonymous first published 12 Steps and 12 Traditions in 1953. Bill W., who, along with Dr. Bob S., founded Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935, wrote the book to share 18 years of collective experience within the fellowship on how AA members recover and how our society functions. In recent years, some members and friends of AA have asked if it would be wise to update the language, idioms, and historical references in the book to, to present a more contemporary image for the fellowship. However, because the book has helped so many alcoholics find recovery, there exists strong sentiment within the fellowship against any change to it. In fact, the 2002 General Service Con Conference discussed this issue, and it was unanimously recommended that the text in the book, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, written by Bill W., remain as is, recognizing the fellowship's feelings that Bill's writing be retained as originally published. We hope that the collective spiritual experience of the AA pioneers captured in these pages continues to help alcoholics and friends of AA understand the principles of our program. So basically, to me, that is telling me that the language in here is going to be very similar to the language in the AA Big Book. So there, there may predominantly be more masculine references um, of individuals. And so uh, some of the language, you know, is from uh, almost a century ago. So... We just need to be respectful of that, and I do love how they say, we hope that the collective spiritual experience of the AA pioneers. So, uh, I think similarly to the way people feel about their uh, spiritual texts, such as the Bible, or the Torah, um, or the Quran, um, that <clears throat> we don't want to change those words, uh, and that the spirit of those words is what you understand. So... Now the foreword. Alcoholics Anonymous is a worldwide fellowship of more than 100,000 alcoholic men and women who are banded together to solve their common problems and to help fellow sufferers in recovery from that age-old baffling malady alcoholism. This book deals with the 12 steps and the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. It presents an <clears throat> explicit view of the principles by which AA members recover and by which their society functions. A's 12 Steps are a group of principles spiritual in their nature which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. A's 12 Traditions apply to the life of the fellowship itself. They outline the means by which AA maintains its unity and relates itself to the world about it, and the way it lives and grows. So, as an aside, the way I explain the 12 Steps and the 12 Traditions to people, often, is that the 12 steps are personal. They are the principles by which each of us live. So uh, we experience them, them each very differently, but we all live by the same code. Um, but they mean different things to all of us. Uh, so it is very personal, and that helps us keep us ourselves on, on track. But the 12 traditions is for the group, or the fellowship, the life of the fellowship itself. <clears throat> it is... Uh, it helps us maintain our unity, and it helps us to relate to the outside world. So, though the essays which follow were written mainly for members, it is thought by many of AA's friends that these pieces might arouse interest and find application outside AA itself. Many people, non-alcoholics, report that as a result of the practice of AA's 12 steps, they have been able to meet other difficulties of life. They think that the 12 steps can mean more than sobriety for problem drinkers. They see in them a way to happy and effective living for many, alcoholic or not. 
There is, too, a rising interest in the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. Students of human relations are beginning to wonder how and why AA functions as a society. Why is it, they ask, that in AA no member can be set in personal authority over another, yet nothing like a central government can anywhere be seen? How can a set of traditional principles, having no legal force at all, hold the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous in unity and effectiveness? The second section of this volume, though designed for AA's membership, will give such inquirers an inside view of AA never before possible. Alcoholics Anonymous began in 1935 at Akron, Ohio, as the outcome of a meeting between a well-known surgeon and a New York broker. Both were severe cases of alcoholism and were destined to become co-founders of the AA Fellowship. The basic principles of AA, as they are known today, are borrowed mainly from the fields of religion and medicine, though some ideas upon which success, success finally depended were the result of, no, of noting the behavior and needs of the fellowship itself. After three years of trial and error in selecting the most workable tenets upon which the society could be based, and after a large amount of failure in getting alcoholics to recover, three successful groups emerged. The first at Akron, the second at New York, and the third at Cleveland. Even then, it was hard to find two score of sure recoveries in all three groups. Nevertheless, the Infant Society determined to set down its experience in a book which finally reached the public in April 1939. At this time, the recoveries numbered about 100. The book was called Alcoholics Anonymous, and from it, the fellowship took its name. In it, alcoholism was described from the alcoholic's point of view. The spiritual ideas of the society were codified for the first time in the 12 steps, and the application of these steps to the alcoholic's dilemma was made clear. The remainder of the book was devoted to 30 stories or case, or case histories in which the alcoholics described their drinking experiences and recoveries. This established identification with alcoholic readers and proved to them that the virtually impossible had now become possible. The book Alcoholics Anonymous became the basic text of the Fellowship, and it still is. This present volume proposes to broaden and deepen the understanding of the 12 steps as first written in the earlier work. With the publication of the book Alcoholics Anonymous in 1939, the pioneering period ended, and a prodigious chain, and a prodigious chain reaction set in as the recovered alcoholics carried their mes message to still others. In the next years, alcoholics flocked to AA by tens of thousands, largely as a result of excellent and continuous publicity freely given by magazines and new newspapers throughout the world. Clergymen and doctors alike rallied to the new movement, giving it unstinted support and endorsement. This startling expansion brought with it very severe growing pains. Proof that alcoholics could recover had been made, but it was by no means sure that such great numbers of yet erratic people could live and work together with harmony and good effect. Everywhere, there arose threatening questions of membership, money, personal relations, public relations, management of groups, clubs, and scores of other perplexities. It was out of this vast welter of explosive experience that AA's 12 traditions took form and were first published in 1946 and later confirmed at AA's first international convention held at Cleveland in 1950. The tradition section of this volume portrays in some detail the experience which finally produced the 12 traditions, and so gave AA its present form, substance and unity. As AA now enters maturity, it has begun to reach into 40 foreign lands. In the view of its friends, this is but the beginning of its unique and valuable service. It is hoped that this volume will afford all who read it a close-up view of the principles and forces which have made Alcoholics Anonymous what it is. So, uh, there's a uh, asterisk here that in 2014, AA is, is established in approximately 170 countries. <clears throat> Very global. So, we will begin with the 12 steps. Step 1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable. Who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one, of course. Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. It is truly awful to admit that, glass in hand, we have warped our minds into such an obsession for destructive drinking that only an act of providence can, per can remove it from us. No other kind of bankrup bankruptcy is like this one. Alcohol, now become the rapiest creditor, 
bleeds us of all self-sufficiency and all will to resist its demands. Once this stark fact is accepted, our bankruptcy as going human concerns is complete. But upon entering AA, we soon take quite an another view of this absolute humiliation. We perceive that only through utter defeat are we able to take our first steps toward liberation and strength. Our admissions of personal powerlessness finally turn out to be firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. We know that little good can come to any alcoholic who joins AA unless he has first accepted his devastating weakness and all its consequences. Until he so humbles himself, his sobriety, if any, will be precarious. Of real happiness, he will find none at all. Proved beyond doubt by an immense experience, this is one of the facts of AA life. The principle that we shall find no enduring strength until we first admit complete defeat is the main taproot from which our whole society has sprung and flowered. When first challenged to admit defeat, most of us revolted. We had approached AA expecting to be taught self-confidence. Then we had to be told that so far as alcohol is concerned, self-confidence was no good whatever. In fact, it was a total liability. Our sponsors declared that we were the victims of a mental obsession so subtly powerful that no amount of human willpower could break it. There was, they said, no such thing as a personal conquest of this compulsion by the unaided will. Relentlessly deepening our dilemma, our sponsors pointed out our increasing sensitivity to alcohol, an allergy they called it. The tyrant alcohol wielded a double-edged sword over us. First, we were smitten by an insane urge that condemned us to go on drinking, and then by an allergy of the body that ensured we would ultimately destroy ourselves in the process. Few indeed were those who, so assailed, had ever won through though sorry. Few indeed were those who, so assailed, had ever won through in single handed combat. It was a statistical fact that alcoholics almost never recovered on their own resources, and this had been true, apparently, ever since man had first crushed grapes. In A's pioneering time, none but the most desperate cases could swallow and digest this unpalatable truth. Even these late graspers often had difficulty in realizing how hopeless they actually were, but a few did, and when these laid hold of AA principles, with all the fervor with which the drowning sees life preservers, they almost invariably got well. That is why the first edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, published when our membership was small, dealt with low-bottom cases only. Many less desperate alcoholics tried AA, but did not succeed because they could not make the admission of hopelessness. It is a tremendous satisfaction to record that in the following years this changed. Alcoholics who still had their health, their families, their jobs, and even two cars in the garage began to recognize their alcoholism. As this trend grew, they were joined by young people who were scarcely more than potential alcoholics. They were spared that last 10 or 15 years of literal hell the rest of us had gone through. Since step one requires an admission that our lives have become unmanageable, how could, how, could such, how could people such as these take this step? It was obviously necessary to raise the bottom the rest of us had hit to the point where it would hit them. By going back in our own drinking histories, we, sh we could show that our years before we realized it were out of control, that our drinking even then was no mere habit, that it was indeed the beginning of a fatal progression. To the doubters, we could say, perhaps you're not an alcoholic after all. Why don't you try some more controlled drinking? Bearing in mind, meanwhile, that we have told you about alcoholism. This attitude brought immediate and practical results. It was then discovered that when one alcoholic had planted in the mind of another the true nature of his malady, that person could never be the same again. Following every spree, he would say to himself, maybe those AAs were right. After a few such experiences, often years before the onset of extreme difficulties, he would return to us, convinced he had hit bottom as truly as any of us. John Barleycorn himself had become more, uh, become our best advocate. Why all this insistence that every AA must hit bottom first? The answer is that few people w will sincerely try to practice the AA program unless they have hit bottom. For practice, practicing AA's remaining 11 steps means the adoption of attitudes and action that almost no alcoholic who's still drinking can dream of taking. Who wishes to be rigorously honest and tolerant? Who wants to confess his faults to another and make restitution for harm done? 
Who cares anything about a higher power, let alone meditation and prayer? Who wants to sacrifice time and energy in trying to carry AA's mes message to the next sufferer? No. The average alcohol no, the average alcoholic, self-centered in the extreme, doesn't care for this prospect unless he has to do these things in order to stay alive himself. Under the lash of alcoholism, we are driven to AA, and there we discover the fatal nature of our situation. Then, and only then, do we become as open-minded to conviction and as willing to listen as the dying can be. We stand ready to do anything which will lift the merciless obsession from us. And that is step one. And that is a lot of information. First, as a reference, John Barleycorn is a reference to alcohol from the 20s and 30s, from a long time ago. Um, our friend John Barleycorn, meaning like our friend uh, grain liquor, grain alcohol, whatever. Um, so that is that reference in here. I did say that it was going to be mostly masculine uh, in its references, so I apologize for that, but hopefully the spirit comes through. So, <clears throat> One thing that I definitely always look back on, and I have lots of highlights and um, writing throughout here. Uh, one thing I always look back on is a moment that says, Many less desperate alcoholics tried AA but did not succeed because they could not make the admission of hopelessness. It is tremendous satisfaction to record that in the fellowship in the following years, things changed. Alcoholics who still had their health, their families, their jobs, and even two cars in the garage began to recognize their alcoholism. I know I fall into that group. Um, I was not in a hospital. I was not on the street. I was not any of that. I uh, had an apartment, had a car, had a job. Um, but I got arrested and had a DUI and realized that I had a problem. Um, because, like they say here, following every spree, he would say to himself, maybe those AAs were right. After a few such experiences, often years before the answer, um, no. This attitude brought immediate and practical results. It was then discovered that when one alcoholic planted in the mind of another the true nature of his or her malady, or their malady, that person could never be the same again. I firmly believe that. Once we kind of plant it, or somebody sees, um, from our experiences, uh, they are having similar experiences. Um, once that seed is planted, it may take years, but, uh, I, I firmly believe that person, there are people out there who then come and realize, oh my gosh, I'm doing this. And they have a bottom of some kind. Um, that's why, I don't know how they say they had to raise it. But I think we came to an understanding of that a bottom's a bottom. And somebody's bottom, like mine, um, parked in my car in the Exolana parking garage, is my bottom, but somebody else's bottom could have been a fatal DUI uh, uh, with a fatal car accident, which is awful. Um, that they now have to live through and be tried for. Uh, you know, or losing their family or becoming homeless. Uh, you know, somebody, everyone's bottom is different. Uh, but there, there's a bottom at some point for most of us. Uh, although in AA, we do like to say that a lot of bottoms have trapdoors. But um, it is in that complete, desperate, hopeless, done, like done, uh, moment of life. That's when this can really... Uh, start to hit and that's what they have to ask for at the very beginning because nothing really can be done after that Which they which they make very clear here of like what self-centered person in the throes of, the, of their drinking is going to want to suddenly take responsibility for everything and start uh, Making amends and calling people friends and family to apologize for their behavior when they're in the throes of their behavior no one <clears throat> So So that's it it is just a complete willingness to say, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm fucked. Sorry for my language, but that's it. It's just saying, it's just answering the question. Are you fucked? Yep, I was. I was totally fucked. And I had nothing left. And I had to say, 
I am powerless over alcohol. I mean, life is unmanageable. So tomorrow we will go to step two. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Please, if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions, please leave them. Uh, as always, blessings and peace, love, and coffee.